<clears throat> Sorry about the noise. All right, well, welcome. Happy Monday, Martin Luther King Day. We're going to do a back bending practice today. And I probably have overplanned this class. So I'm thinking that what I plan today will be for Monday and Friday. So it's a lot of content and I certainly don't wanna rush. I don't like that feeling as a student when I experience where my, I have a teacher, I haven't been there in a long time, but she, uh, she tends to overplan her classes and instead of saving content for another day, she'll just rush through it and I don't, I know how that can feel on the receiving end. So I'm hoping we can just pace ourselves and enjoy each pose and uh, whatever's left over we'll leave for Friday. So we're gonna use the bolster today. We're gonna to use basically all of your props. So make sure you have them. We won't use a chair. So if you don't have your chair, you don't need it today. And we're just gonna take a moment to come into a quiet seated centering position. So just spend some time. You're going to be in your less dominant cross-legged position. <clears throat> spend some time to be as equal as you can, left and right, also front and back on the sitting bones, aligning your shoulders above the hips, just gently turning the shoulder blades in toward the chest and keeping the navel drawn back toward the spine. Your pelvic tilt is neutral and your skull is arriving right over the spine. Level the chin with the floor so you're not tipping the chin up or down. And then just take a moment to drop the shoulders, drop the shoulder blades down your back, drop the sitting bones. And just really connect with the floor. Closing the eyes lightly and just looking away from the brain. Try to find relaxation in the jaw, the abdomen. And just imagine you're a surfer and you're riding each wave of your own breath. Each wave is unique. You're giving your attention to each passing breath. And sensing your body, the inner body, the outer body. Sensing tension, maybe in the sheath of the skin, maybe deeper. And when we can get still enough and quiet enough, this is usually when we can detect intention. Something you might be devoting this practice to or your energy to today. There was a monk that was invited to give a speech to a college and <clears throat> it was supposed to be a long speech. And he got up on stage and just said, all your problems can be solved with intention and attention. And then he left the stage. So with that, joining your hands together in front of your heart, coming into an in-breath, floating the breastbone forward on an out-breath, keeping it forward, bowing toward your heart. Releasing your hands, lift your head, gently allow the eyes to float open. Welcome. We're going to begin in a passive back bend, reclining bound angle pose. If you don't own a bolster, you can make one with a couple blankets. You can also put a pillow in a pillowcase and kind of curl it into a, a rounder shape, and then you might tie it. So if you want to create an at home bolster, we're going to be coming into the, the full pose. So usually you want a little bit of support for your hips. Usually want to create additional height for your head. You can use 
blocks if you don't have lots of blankets, but blankets are a little bit better for the hips because they are soft and so they allow your, your legs to keep opening, whereas a block might prevent that. You can always adjust the blocks down to kind of create that um, effect of continuing to open the legs. We're also going to use the belt. So if you have a loop with your belt, you can just start to make it really big so that it can fit over your head down to your hips. And then it goes within the space of the legs. This is sometimes where people get lost. Is it goes within the space of the legs, so it should be on top of your legs with your bound angle shaped, and then just slip it under the toes. And then you're gonna pull up any excess that you have making it taut and try to keep it right over the sacrum and along the hip creases so it's not riding high on the back body. You can keep the tail close to you and hopefully as you come to the pose and sustain the pose, you can maybe tighten it up if you start to need a little bit more. <clears throat> You're going to recline back so that the bolster begins where your rib cage begins. And then, of course, the head needs sufficient support so that you don't have the neck with a huge gap or a big arch in it. We want the chin pointed toward the chest rather than away from the chest. And then unfolding your arms so that you have palms up, shoulders in a passive external rotation, which is so lovely for the shoulders. And then maybe lift your buttocks and just kind of pull them away from the bolster and maybe also include a gentle pelvic tilt, tilting the pelvis back, tailbone toward the ceiling. And then you essentially have to do nothing more with effort. So the next stage is just really dropping in. Letting all of the support beneath you really hold you here. Feeling the support to the hips, really cradling the legs so they can surrender rather than grip. Observing the breath flow in this position where the diaphragm is so open. And just kind of make it your meditation to scan the body and seek out areas in the body that are still not quite on board, maybe still contracted or effortful. And back to that image of the surfer riding the waves of the breath. So even though the backbending practice is more vigorous than our other practices throughout the week, it's really the precursor to next week, which is restorative week, because we start to invite the brain, front brain to be absorbed by the back brain because we can't see our back bodies. We have to use other modes of perception to detect and become aware of the back body. We might keep that image of the front brain is kind of becoming more passive, absorbed by the back brain. We'll just be here another 30 seconds. Just keep scanning the body, trying to let go of tension. Before we completely come out, we're going to free the legs. Just find a way to release your feet. Maybe loosen the belt, or if you're able to slip your foot out, that can help you free yourself. Don't worry about the strap as long as your legs are free. You're just going to step your feet wide, let the knees angle in, and just allowing the groins and the hips to come back to a less extended state.
We're going to use our bolster for a supported spinal twist. So you can roll off to your left hip side. And again, don't worry about the belt. If it's easy to get off, you can just move it aside. If it's not in your way, you just look at where it is. And with the left hip against the bolster end, you're just going to sit up nice and tall and a nice tall position. Just start to revolve your spine as well as you can toward the bolster. You can look down and see how the chest is not quite squaring with the bolster. So your work is to get it a little more square and then you're going to lengthen yourself onto the bolster. Attempt to bring your right cheek down and if that's too extreme to begin with, land your left cheek. If you're able to keep the nose free and clear, you can also land your forehead that might involve building up your blanket. So find that first starting position and you can always advance to the right cheek if that becomes accessible. But again, you're really just gonna try to become passive. The spine is more willing to move when the limbs are kind of passive and heavy, when your front body is supported. So trusting that you've kind of set it up well, you're just gonna drop in. And throughout the practice, gently bringing your awareness to your back body. Again, scanning for tensions. Maybe the elbows can step wider to support the shoulders releasing. Maybe your legs are still gripping a bit. Maybe it's time to turn the head. Maybe there's some stuckness in the lower back. Just a few more breaths here. You can take your hands and just take the palms against the floor and press down, come up on an inhale. And all you need to do is switch your legs to the other side and switch your bolster to the other side. I have this giant bug visiting me right now. I think they're called stink bugs. So you're gonna set up the same way, just turning well with an upright spine, look down at the chest, See if you can bring a little more movement of the chest toward the bolster and then spreading your length down. This time the left cheek might land, otherwise the forehead or right cheek, you have to determine if it's a safe or a wise action. And once you've met that first edge, dropping in. So the two pillars of yoga are practice and renunciation and those apply within the container of a single pose. So the effortful part of the pose and then the renunciation, the letting go. Notice the spontaneity of the breath, the automatic breathing. Be with those waves. Each wave is unique. The breath is an eternal wave in and of itself. Notice that hip against the floor and notice if it's integrated with the floor, if there's some layer of resistance there. And 
Maybe turning the cheek now. We'll be here another half a minute. Again, you're going to take your palms against the floor and just press down, come up on an in breath slowly. Gently move out of that twist. We're going to come into Pari Ankasana, cross legged position with our legs. So all you need is two blocks. And since we did the non dominant cross legged position for our seated centering, we're going to do the dominant cross-legged position. So it's two blocks. One is for the area of the dorsal spine right behind the sternum. One is for the head. I suggest a lower, a medium height block to support the dorsal spine. And then you can kind of just put the head block in place once you're reclining back, you'll kind of know what you need there. Again, we want to have chin and forehead level rather than the chin floating higher than the forehead. So I usually hold the block with my thumbs to kind of stabilize it and keep it in place as I recline back. Try to land with the shoulder blade area hitting the block. And then my head will come down and I'll adjust that. It's fine to have your head um, higher than you need. In other words, it's fine to have your chin tilted down toward the chest. Just try not to have it away from the chest, okay? If you prefer to have your chin and forehead level, you can also just have the block at that height. So just kind of Goldilocks it, as they say. And then again, unfolding the arms so that your palms are up, your shoulders are in a surrendered external rotation talked about the skin cells, imagining them trickling from the front armpits to the back armpits. And letting your attention move to the back body here. So we're starting with some passive back bends today. So rather than studying the effort, which is a very high level here, you can just study the shape. Maybe imagine the spine yawning open, the front spine yawning open, which is what happens in our back bends. And this is an action that we don't have enough of in our lifestyle with driving, screens, sitting in chairs. So we are just enjoying this yawning open, rebalancing of the spine. Every time you inhale, you can support that yawning open. Think about your front spine getting stretch in a really much needed way. Meanwhile, the back spine is getting this juicy massage between the sets of vertebrae and the discs that live there between. to stay another half a minute. You don't have to really work at all here. So just keep the attention in the back body. Keep the attention on the breath. Notice how easy it is for the eyes to roll up in the head here because we have this very kind of exciting, seductive energy in the upper body. So just kind of temper it with a pointed down gaze. So this is a big pose to leave. So first just step your feet on the ground. And you'll just pick one arm to kind of lean over toward, moving as carefully as you can off of the height, flat height. You're going to come up. 
And we are going into hero and reclining hero today. So you're going to set up both, but we'll start with the seated version. And if you need to modify either pose, you definitely can. So of course you want to have the sitting bones supported. Some of us like to have the shin supported. You might need more than just a block under your sitting bones. It might be two blocks. It might be a whole bolster. Some Another way you can modify this pose as it develops in your body is to do more of what's called a Vajrasana, which is sitting on the heels until we can learn to develop that W sitting. But we are going to attempt to create the the shape of the pose, and then you modify back if you need to. So heels sitting outside the hips, all four corners of each kneecap looking straight ahead. We generally tend to see the kneecaps rotating in. So there's a few things you can do about that. One is if you have knee discomfort, you're gonna sandwich a blanket from the backs of your knees all the way to the heels. If you have ankle discomfort, you can roll tiny mats. You can cut up an old yoga mat and roll them and put them there for anything else that kind of imitates that shape. You can also have your blanket underneath your shins end at the ankle. So there's a little drop off and that will create a nice amount of support for the front ankles to eventually open. For a lot of us, that's an area of tension. You might sit on a whole bolster and modify that way. So there's lots you can do. But before you get it too refined, you're going to set up the reclining um, support. So you might need a lot of support and you might not need as much. So you just kind of have to, this is one pose I do kind of base it on my past experience because generally it doesn't change a whole lot for me. And I usually set it up with ample support and then I reduce it. It's easier to do that than to try to build it up. Um, so what I like to use are a couple blocks in kind of a, a tiered, one is taller than the other setup. So you can do medium high if you're gonna do this. You can do low medium, depends again what you need. I always need ample height because I'm very tight in this pose. So that's what mine looks like. And some people go flat on the ground. So this is definitely a, um, a, a customized, unique setup for everybody. Okay. Some people have um, lordosis or that sway back kind of, um, they were born with it. I have that as well. So you might need a little blanketing where your lumbar spine will be so that you don't feel very collapsed there. Um, that can be a vulnerable feeling. And if you don't have the support in this pose, you aren't likely to develop it or go deeper. So you might throw something there as well, like another blanket. Okay. So we're not going to recline yet. See a few people testing it out, which is a great way to test out that reclining setup, but we are going to start seated. So before you, before we work with the arms, just take a moment to sit up off your uh, sitting bone support, and you're going to take each calf muscle and turn them out with your thumbs. You can just kind of roll them out. And even though we lose some of that when we, we're going to sit back up, you're going to do another adjustment. You're going to take your hands under your thighs and draw the outer thighs in. And you might go back to, if you can maneuver it, the calf muscle out. So do it on both sides. You will lose some of it each time you sit up, but you'll eventually learn to kind of trap it there and keep it there. And then you'll see your, your knees pointing forward. If you don't, you really do want to take care of the knees because this is an excellent pose for knee health. It's a pose that if done wrong, will hurt your knees. So we, we had stakes are high here. Okay, so make sure your knees are looking forward. So pressing down on the soles of the feet, adjust the shoulders back. Navel in, tailbone in, skull right above the spine. And you're gonna bring your attention down, down, down to all that's kind of setting, sitting down either directly or with propping. And then think about your outer shins. You just kind of think about the flesh of the outer shins dripping down toward the floor. This is gonna help your knees as well. Outer shins keep engaging down. 
Okay, keeping that sense of foundation, raise the arms. Try to move the arms so they're right outside the ears. Fully extend your elbows. Anchor the shoulders into the trunk, but at the same time, somehow paradoxically, keep the sides of the trunk long. So you're extending up through the crown of the head, but you're taking the inner tips of the shoulder blades down the back body, and then you're somehow keeping the sides of the trunk long. And remember those that kind of seductive eyeball experience. So keep your eyes really grounded into the back of the head and also relaxed and your gaze steady on the horizon. So don't let your eyes roll up. And then go ahead and grab your elbows with opposite hands and take the elbow tips any amount back, pushing those inner shoulder blades up gently forward, but watch that you didn't throw yourself into sway back. So navel in, tailbone in, eyes relaxed. Armpits open, these vital energy pockets open. Soften the jaw, tailbone in, good. Re-extend the arms only to change the crossing of the arms. Re-extend the arms, switch the crossing of the arms. Elbow tips back, soften the eyes, soften the jaw. Go back to your foundation, outer shins down, small toes down, tailbone down, sitting bones moving into the prop, not just taped there, not just pasted there. Develop roots out of the sitting bones. Good, re-extend the arms and then release your arms down. And now you're gonna see about the recline and you might not get all the way there. So just know that you're going to Test it out, and then you're going to have to do what you need to do to make it safe and sustainable. So it might mean you're coming into a cross-legged reclining position if you absolutely can't do the hero legs. It might mean that you're coming into bound angle again, which we did earlier. So when we come down, we want to see that the knees stay down and together. We don't want the knees flying up and or apart. There's a deep stretch going on to your front thighs. We want to scoop the tailbone into the soft tissue of the body, lengthening the lumbar spine. We want to compact the front ribs so they're not blasting open. So kind of taming the front body, filling the back body with the front body, tilting the chin toward the chest. And then once you feel pretty grounded, you can see about extending the arms in line with the ears. So you're creating a really nice arc you're keeping the sides of the trunk really continuing to extend. The chin tilts down. There's a lot of dynamic action in this pose. A lot of um, heightened action complemented by kind of opposite heightened action. Keep the chin tilted down. So this pose is really helpful for our attention, it keeps us attentive because it's not at all boring. So just riding the next six waves of breath. After that last exhale, you're gonna start to move your hands back to your feet and try to lead yourself back upright with the breastbone leading you. So if there's a rope there, someone's pulling you up by the breastbone, it's not a great thought. We're gonna gently start to deconstruct our setup. And then once your mat is clear, you can just be in the center on your hands and knees preparing for downward facing dog. We're gonna do a little bit of a, a little bit of a flowing sequence with it. We're gonna do two of them. So one is a little bit more involved because it has the chaturanga in it. So if you don't prefer to do the chaturanga, you'll stick with the first sequence we do. So we're gonna do four total. Two are gonna be the modified, two are gonna be the chaturanga. If you want to do all four with the modified version, feel free. So from hands and knees, 
Take the toes underneath, even the small toes. On an exhale, extend your legs. And just let this be all about releasing that deep flexion from your knees, from hero pose, from Virasana. Rolling the inner knees back, rolling the inner thighs back, keeping a strong forward pelvic tilt. And on an in-breath, ride that breath forward to plank position. You might have to adjust your feet because we want to be shoulders, hips, and heels in a line. Okay, scoop the belly toward the back, tailbone into the body. Good. So knees down wide, feet together, sit back, child's pose. And just stay for a few breaths. So imagine you're gonna to try to slide under a very low fence, meaning there's not a lot of room between the bottom of the fence and the ground. You're gonna keep your chin and chest really close to the floor and slither onto your front side. And I said slither because we're coming into cobra. So once you're on your front side, separate the feet, grounding into the small toes, lift the inner thighs, slide your hands slightly back so they're more consistent with the sides of the rib cage. On an exhale, just do one press up into cobra. Keep the buttocks soft. Shoot the breastbone forward. Roll the flesh of the arms front to back. And then release it down. From here, toes under. Exhale, downward dog. Again, open the backs of the knees. Tip the pelvis way forward. When you do that, it's like you could hold pencils in your hip creases. Ride the in-breath forward, plank position, shoulders above the wrists, shoulders, hips, and heels in one line, tailbone toward the floor. Look forward there. Good, knees down, wide, feet together, sit back, child's pose. Tailbone toward the floor, one single curve along your spine. Quieting pose. So this is where you're gonna go to if you're gonna skip Chaturanga for the next two. We're gonna slide under that fence, moving forward on your mat, open up the feet so you're ready for Cobra, adjust the legs so you're centered up on the front thigh, slide the hands back, tailbone toward the floor, exhale, Cobra pose, soften the buttocks, spread the buttocks even, and release it. Downward facing dog. Inhale, plank position. And this is where we might fork off to our own experience. We might come back to child. If not, you're gonna look forward, hinging the elbows, Chaturanga Dandasana, and then all the way down. Good. If you're in child, you can take your time and then come into Cobra pose. If you're in the prone position already, exhale, Cobra pose. Rolling the flesh from the inner front armpit all the way out to the back armpit. Good, release. Once more. Final one here. Toes under, exhale, downward facing dog. Inhale, plank position. Choose your own adventure. If you're gonna chaturanga, look forward. Exhale, 90 degree elbows, hold it, hold it. Don't sag, don't bag all the way down, flip the toes back, slide the hands back, exhale, Bhujangasana, Cobra Pose. Okay, so we're all gonna meet up in the prone position. So if you're there, you can stay there, make a little pillow out of your arms, rest the cheek, and then go ahead and bend the knees and sweep your legs back and forth. All right, so we're gonna do a little work with um, Bekhasana, which is basically the inverse position of hero pose. So we're gonna re-stretch the thighs, even though we got a really good thigh stretch with hero pose. We're going to cross the right forearm in front of us and just use it as a pillow for your forehead. 
I'm not going to do that because I need to keep talking. So if I'm looking up, that you're you can listen and keep your head grounded. Your legs are going to be hip distance. So this is not hero yet because hero would have the knees together. We're just going to stretch, stretch the thighs individually. So with that, forehead grounded, feet hip distance, bend your left knee. Reach back and grab your left top of your foot or the ankle, whatever you can reach. Use a strap if you can't. And notice how we probably created a big um, concave position in our hip flexor. So our work is to take the tailbone into the floor and try to iron out the hip flexor where the groin meets the thigh. Okay, so lengthening the flesh of the buttocks, tailbone toward the floor, minimizing that big concave area there, try to flatten it into the ground. And this is what's gonna stretch the thigh, not tugging on the foot. So rather than tugging on the foot, just kick back, meaning just press the top of the foot into the hand or whatever you're holding, maybe it's the ankle, and stretch the front thigh, breathe into that stretch. Meanwhile, right leg is passive and quiet. Remember, we don't want knees flying off the floor, which is the same when we're in the inverted hero pose. Keep your knee anchored to the floor. This little weird doorway for the breath. Just a couple more breaths. You can start to let go, extend your leg. Left arm is going to be your forehead pillow. Make sure legs are still hip distance and even. So we want to have the centered thighs, the kneecaps down, all 10 toes down. And you can bend your right knee and reach back and grab the top of the foot, the front ankle. Tailbone in, pelvis tilts back, minimizing that gapping the right hip flexor, keeping the knee anchored to the floor, and maybe a little more pressure of the foot or ankle into your hand. See how that turns the dial up a little bit. The buttocks are soft, no clamping buttocks, spreading the inner thighs out. Apply the breath. Just three more breaths. Let your belly smushing into the floor, fill the back body with breath. And then softly releasing right ankle or foot. Now you're gonna walk the knees together. So we're gonna create that inverted flipped over version of hero pose now. So different arm position. So now the right arm is gonna cross in front of the chest so that your right elbow sits in line with your right shoulder. Keeping the knees together, bend your left knee and reach back and grab hold of the foot. Okay, so you can grab the toes because eventually we learn a hand position where we rotate. We're not gonna do that today. We're not focused on that today. So grab the toes however you can, knees together. Now remember the, the kind of the goal of Kiros, Virasana where we bring the heel outside the hip. You can use a strap if you need to. So when we bring the heel outside the hip, keeping the kneecap pointing out, so don't let the knee rotate. Try to minimize the gap of the hip flexor. And use the arm crossing the body to keep the shoulders square, to keep you supported. Just three more breaths. So imagine doing this with both hands. It's a big doozy of a pose. We're just learning it piece by piece here. Now start to let go, extend the leg. Windshield wiper your legs. So make pillow out of your both arms, rest your cheek, bend your knees, sweep the legs back and forth. Just try to recover some ease, neutrality in your back. And you can extend your legs again and walk the knees together. Left arm crosses in front of the chest. So elbow right below shoulder line, 
forearm crossing in front of the chest, bending the right knee, making contact with your toes, either with a strap, you can hold the sole of the foot with the strap or grabbing directly. You're squeezing that little gap shut between your right hip flexor and the floor, soften the buttocks, directing the heel toward the outer hip without the knee uprooting, keep the knees together. A forward gaze, try to rotate the flesh of the shoulders from the front armpit back, shoot the breastbone forward, keep tipping the pelvis back, soften your gaze. Two more breaths. And releasing, good work. One more time, clearing any discomfort, any tension from your lower back to swing the legs back and forth. So if you have any discomfort of your pelvis or hips against the floor, you can spread out a blanket. Just don't let the blanket come above the navel. Um, we are gonna do a few more positions here um, in the prone position, belly down. So we're gonna come into locust pose where we float all four limbs. You might have a little more contact to the center body. So feel free to spread out something thin if you'd like. <clears throat> And you're going to set yourself up again with hip distance feet. Okay, wonderful. Small toes are down as much as big toes are down. So you take a moment to roll the inner thighs up, the outer thighs down. You have to do that adjustment on each side. And you can really do this easily by pressing each top of your foot down individually and freeing up the thighs to rotate. You should also feel the buttocks are, are really spread wide and soft. So we're gonna take the arms back. The first one we're gonna do is, is more modified because the palms face down, which encourages the shoulders to externally rotate. So we have, it's still gonna be work because we're fighting gravity here, but in the next position, the classical position, we rotate the knuckles face the floor and we have more work to do to turn the flesh. So we're gonna start with a little bit of an assist, palms facing the floor. I want you to remember that when you do eventually pick everything up, we want to look back to one side and see that the wrist is as high as the shoulder. So we have, uh, again, we're against gravity here. So we got to keep that in mind. So look straight ahead. And on an exhale, pick up all four limbs. Shoot back through the fingernails. Look back to one arm. Try to lift the wrist to be as high as the shoulder line. Remember to keep your buttocks soft. So inner thighs lift, outer thighs roll down. Shoot the breastbone forward, soften your gaze, relax the forehead, soften your jaw, soften the buttocks. Two more breaths, relax the forehead. Good, one more breath and on an exhale, float it down. Cross your arms, rest your cheek, bend your knees and sweep the legs back and forth. Okay, so we're going to set up the second one. Knuckles face the floor for this one. So we have more work to do to get those draggy shoulders picked up. So we get the external rotation, which of course supports that sailing kite of the sternum that we talked about last week. So first prepare your legs, centered, hip distance, soften the buttocks. We're going to extend the arms back now. Just float them just a soft, uh, half an inch off the floor, knuckles face down. On an exhale, pick everything up. Look back, make sure your wrists are where they should be in line with the shoulders. Lift your inner thighs. Try to roll the flesh of the front armpit toward the back armpit. Move the breastbone forward, tip the shoulder blades in, relax the forehead, relax the jaw, relax the buttocks, keep lifting the legs. Shoot back through the fingertips. Two more breaths. Good, and rest. Go ahead. Make sure you're taking turns with which cheek gets to rest each time you windshield wipe through your legs. And just coming into a more regulated breath.
Okay, so we're going to kind of combine the Bekasana and the Locust Pose, some of the actions of each, with Dhanurasana, with Bow Pose. So Bow Pose, the knees stay hip distance, so that's more like Locust, but we're grabbing the ankles, which is more like Bekasana. We're going to pick everything up, which is like Locust, so all four limbs are going to lift. If you know you have trouble grabbing the front ankles directly, you're going to take a strap and just catch the front ankles with your strap and you'll hold the strap. You can also modify into a really soft bow pose if you want to just extend arms forward, legs back. That's another option if the strap isn't your favorite. So let's begin with knees, hip distance, feet, hip distance. And then you're gonna bend the knees and just see about making contact with the front ankles. Okay, sometimes there's a Charlie horse in the thigh when you go for grabbing the, um, <clears throat> the front ankle. So one thing to remember if you tend to get cramps easily is cramping is a sign that uh, your muscles are confused, whether you want them to contract or relax. So um, when we go for that grab, you might confuse the muscle. So just try to soften the hamstring, which is where it usually comes in and see if you can kind of change that relationship with <laughs> these, um, you'll get to know these moments in your practice that you tend to get these cramps. So you start to just kind of analyze it a little bit. So once you have the hold, notice how there's a tendency for the feet to rotate down. So you wanna reach up through the big toe ball mounds, through the insteps of the feet. You wanna roll down with the small toes, just like when your legs are extended, pay attention to small toes anchoring. Okay, soften the buttocks, iron out the hip creases so you're not so concave there. Take the tailbone into the floor, pelvis tilts back. Broad in the buttocks, inner thighs spread out like they're melting in the sun. You're going to go ahead and exhale and pick everything up. Look forward, shoot the breastbone forward, small toes down. Don't let the knees separate. Keep them in line with hips. Iron up the forehead, relax the eyes back to the back of the head. Keep shooting the breastbone forward. Think about the flesh of the front armpits traveling back. Soften the buttocks. Keep picking everything up slightly higher. Two more breaths. One more breath, exhale, set it down, leave the knees bent. One last time, cross your arms, rest your cheek, sweep the legs back and forth. Okay, you did great. So we need to neutralize a little bit. A couple things we wanna do now. We wanna do a forward bend that's not intense. So you can pick, you can do a child's pose or you could do a downward facing dog. Both are pretty neutral and they're gonna help us kind of return or cleanse the palate of this back bending practice. So you go in, into either one, child's pose. You can do a soft arm child's pose since the point of placing this pose here is to kind of start to wind down. You could do a head supported downward dog if you wanna make it a little bit more passive. And you're just gonna stay and kind of self-guide. You can stay up to a minute, you can, you can do less, but just kind of self-guide when, when it's time to come out. Okay, to take the shoulder blades in, John. Breathe. Nice. Another half a minute. Maybe you're in dog and you'll take a little time in child now. Maybe you're going to stick with dog. Maybe you're going to stick with child. start to find our way to seated. So another thing that's important to include to kind of round out a backbending practice is a twist. And so we're going to do Bharad Vajrasana. 
And for some of us, we might be kind of exhausted with the hero legs at this point. So you would go into a kind of a passive, um, it's like the yin twist that we do, both knees are bent and the feet are just kind of off to the right side in this case. If you want to go into the classical bara Vajrasana, you can bring your right leg into the hero position and you can cross your left foot underneath you. And ideally the knees are together. There's a tendency to kind of fall down into our non-hero leg side. So I'm gonna have you build height up under the left buttock if you're doing the classical um, one leg in hero, one leg eventually in half lotus. So this left leg, which is eventually in half lotus, not today, which means it's gonna sit at the hip crease of the right hip side, is gonna be in its mirror image underneath the foot underneath the right foot. So what you want to see are your right toes pointing straight back and your left toes pointing off to the side. If you're doing your passive legs, your legs can be anywhere. So that's the dis distinction. So you'll notice that your knees want to separate. You're going to kind of clamp them together. You're also going to roll your hero leg shin down as we always do with that hero shin. Okay, so now that you've perfected your legs, hopefully you're not um, your strap is not out of reach. We need our straps. So you're going to close that loop down. It just needs to fit your arm. It doesn't have to be tight either. So just make it small. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's, it can be loose. You're going to put it on your right arm. Okay. Left hand reaches behind your back and finds the tail. You're going to hold as close to the loop as you can. Good. We're going to take a nice big in breath. And at the same time, we're going to sit up really tall. We're going to roll down that right shin if you're in hero leg. Otherwise, just keep your legs grounded. And we're going to throw that right arm hand over to your left thigh, palm down for the beginning. Palm down for the beginning. You can creep your hand closer to that loop if you're able to, your left hand. You're going to start to turn well. To the left, which is why it's important to keep rolling down right shin because otherwise we just kind of uh, uproot ourselves. We need an anchor. When you sense that your twist is near the thoracic, kind of in that armpit chest region, flip to the back of the hand against your thigh so that you can kind of clear some of that congested stuckness that happens there. Using the back of the hand against the thigh, you can start to roll those right side ribs around. Keep trying to roll the front left shoulder back. And remember how seductive twists can be as well. So keeping a soft gaze, relax your jaw, bringing attention to foundational points like outer right shin, right small toe. Finishing out an exhalation and then inhale to come out of it. So you can switch your setup. If you're doing passive legs, you'll just have your feet now off to the left. If you're gonna do the classical hero leg, now it's going to be your left leg. Your right foot tucks under the left ankle. Your right toes should be pointing sideways, left toes pointing back. Knees together, they might not be perfectly together, but try to clamp the knees together. Bolster up the right hip side so you have um, more of a level, balanced pelvis. And then the left arm gets the loop. And then the right hand reaches back behind you. Or you throw the arm, just take a moment to roll the outer shin down if you're in hero, lift the spine, and then throwing the palm to the right thigh. Start to turn to the right, press the palm. This is for kind of the lower part of the twist with the palm against the leg. Try to roll that right shoulder back. As you look away from your left side, try to anchor down into that left shin. Clamp the knees, soften your gaze. 
sense when it's time to flip the hand to kind of clear some of that armpit chest area, bring it around out of the shadows. Just three more exhales. Soften the jaw. Good. So finish the exhale. Inhale, lift yourself up through the top of the head, bring the hand off the thigh. You can start to deconstruct this pose and we're just gonna stretch the legs straight out ahead of us before we prepare for Shavasana, just to get the, the knees back in order and the backs of the knees open. So once you're <clears throat> out of the Bharad Vajrasana, just move the flesh out from under the sitting bones, try to bring the legs and feet together, just tenting up your fingertips next to the hips. Remember this pose is named for the legs supporting a really nice erect spine, Dandasana. Squeeze the backs of the knees toward the floor. Squeeze your quadriceps. Shoot out evenly through the ball mound, big toe, small toe, and the inner and outer heels. Once you feel kind of neutral in your legs, which is what we're going for, then you can start to transition to Shavasana. So you might need some movement before you do that. You might need a few things to set yourself up for support. You can start to go into that fully reclined position. Maybe the bolster comes under the knees. Maybe you're gonna cover with a blanket. Take some time once you're on your back to stretch the legs out, to move the heels slightly wider than the hips. Stretch the arms out so your arms don't touch your torso. Rock your head to adjust the chin down and to lengthen the back of the neck. Take a moment to turn the thumbs a little closer to the floor, the pinkies a little farther from the floor, just to rotate the arms to help the shoulders sit down, to help the chest stay lifted. Once you've made all these little finely tuned adjustments, you can just start to send out that signal, all points bulletin to every little nook and cranny in the body to become passive. You might kind of systematically move from your head toward your feet. If you're turning all of the lights off in the building, Top floor moving to the basement. Practice and renunciation. Serving your breath as if you're watching somebody else breathing. We address the tension in the body. We can 
the evidence here in the corpse pose of the worlds of our consciousness starting to settle. Steadiness of the body that we train into the body starts to permeate the mind, which is why this pose is so important. It's the pose of integration. You're welcome to stay longer. If you're gonna conclude with me. I'm gonna start to invite some deeper breaths. Be careful that you don't invite any agitation to the body or the brain. You might start to include simple movement, re-inviting movement into the body through the fingers and toes. Let the movement travel in from the outermost points of your body, trickling inward. Again, try not to agitate or disturb the body or brain more than you need to. Finding your way onto your right side. Move to your right side, the heart moves toward the center of the chest. Taking your hands against the floor, pressing down firmly to bring yourself up. And when you're sitting upright, move your hands together in front of the heart, have your fingertips extending slightly outward. Have a little bit of a hollow space where the palms come together. Roll the shoulders back. And just lift the corners of the mouth. Just invite a sense of gratitude here. From the place within me that I know to be divine, I honor that place within each of you. Namaste. <clears throat> Thank you.